Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday, the 19th of January. I'm Kate Andrews, the Spectator's Economics Editor, and your host this week. Coming up on the show... The government says it will block Nicola Sturgeon's attempts to bring in new laws to make it easier for people to change gender. Anne McWhorter and Julie Bindle will be on to discuss the union's new dividing line. The Southeast has done very well out of this round's allocation of the leveling up funding, but not all MPs are impressed. I'll speak to Katie Balls for our political update. The rich and powerful gather at Davos this week. Does the conference do any good? Martin van der Weyer will join me. Goldman Sachs has fired more than 3,000 people, yet saw their value increase by billions. Sam Leith joins me to talk about the so-called surplus elite. And finally, Noma, often called the world's best restaurant, has announced its closing. Is this the end of fine dining as we know it? I'll speak to Olivia Potts and Rory Sutherland. Before we get going, thank you to Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management for sponsoring this episode of The Week in 60 Minutes. Canaccord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who offer unwavering support in challenging times. Visit CanDoWealth.com for more information. And if you enjoy Spectator TV, then do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. First up, Nicola Sturgeon wants to make it easier for people to obtain gender recognition certificates, but Rishi Sunak's government is blocking the proposed legislation in the first ever use of this kind of veto power. To explain the row, I'm joined by journalist Anne McWhorter, who writes this week's cover piece, and the activist Julie Bindle. Anne and Julie, thanks for joining me. Anne, you write in this week's magazine about the union's new dividing line. Gender, talk us through it. Okay, well, um, you know, this is a, a very complex legal issue, an existential issue, actually, for, for many uh, women about the definition of sex, the definition of legal sex, and whether or not biological sex takes precedence in equalities legislation over gender, gender identity, assumed and assumed gender identity. Now, the Scottish uh, government has promoted what's called self-ID. It's passed uh, legislation which allows people to change their legal sex uh, effectively by, de by declaration without going through any medical procedure, without medical advice, and only by living in their assumed uh, new legal sex for uh, three months. Now, uh, this has been controversial in Scotland. It was, you know, it went through a very acrimonious debate in the Scottish Parliament, but it was passed. It was passed by the Scottish uh, Parliament, and it's been overridden uh, under what's called Article 35 by the UK government on the grounds that this new interpretation of legal sex does not conform to uh, Westminster's understanding of uh, equalities legislation and that it would cause problems. Now, it's, it's quite complicated to get into this, but just think of this. Someone pops up to Scotland for three months, changes their sex and comes back down again. Um, they will have a gender recognition certificate identifying them uh, if they were previously a woman, now as a man. But that gender recognition certificate will not, will not be valid in England because England requires you to have a medical diagnosis of, gen of gender dysphoria and live in your new sex, your new gender, uh, for a minimum of two years. But you'll be coming down with these, uh, and, and trans groups are already organizing this uh, kind of trans migration for people to come up to Scotland to, to get their uh, easier gender recognition certificates. But these will not be recognized south of the border, except, of course, they will be recognized because there's no way of identifying an invalid Scottish gender recognition certificate. They're not going to inspect people's GRCs at the border. So these people, people will be in, a, you know, asking to join uh, single sex women's groups with these GRCs. Behind that, there's a, a more complex issue about whether or not biological sex takes precedence over, um, over gender. In Scotland, the legal, because of a, it was a, a resolved in a landmark case in the court of session last month, the category of women has been changed to include men. So legal sex is now takes predominance over biological sex. You cannot exclude someone with a gender recognition certificate on the grounds that they are biologically male, or they have male bodies. They are uh, women for all purposes, as the law says. That's not how it's interpreted south of the border. And it's certainly not the way that Suella Brathman thinks, sees it. And many women's groups here are beginning to realize how significant that is, are saying that this seriously damages the right of women to exclude biological males from single sex groups like, you know, support groups for uh, on domestic violence or rape. Julie, as a feminist activist, what do you make of all this? 
Well, first of all, if you include men in the category of women, I mean, it renders our sex-based rights completely meaningless, that there's absolutely no protection, no assumption of single sex space, which we fought for and gained only because a sizable minority of men will commit acts of sexual violence and domestic abuse and the like towards women. So no one ever said all men are rapists. We said enough uh, men are uh, will commit these acts towards women, that we actually need some protection from that. And if we do then experience male violence, we need some refuge from that. So that's the first point. The second point is, of course, that we have a law that makes it very clear that rape is committed by a person with a penis. That is the bedrock of the offence of rape. And all of a sudden, and this is where legislation bleeds into the cultural norms and what we accept as a society, um, all of a sudden we have some newspaper uh, reporting on male rapists who identify as women with the phrase her penis. And we have also um, a requirement in some courts, and certainly this will be in Scotland, and again, uh, using some judicial discretion, it's also across England and Wales, where women who have reported men um, who have sexually assaulted and raped them are required to refer to that person by using female pronouns. So referring to the rapist as she, her, or she'll be admonished by the court. Now, this is an obscenity in the cultural sense. When we get to the legal sense, of course, it's an absolute disaster because it means that um, men who identify as women, who every single piece of research shows, commit acts of violence against women to the same degree as do other men, um, will be able to get, uh, uh, well, that they have a get out of jail free card. We see men in women's prisons that terrify women, where prison officers have said openly that they dare not uh, call these men who are posing as women in prisons to task because they might be deemed to be transphobic. Um, and even the prison service has been captured. We know that the MOJ has been captured and pretty much every institution by this transgender ideology. So to say that men can be in a category of women, what's the point? What is the point of even talking about sexism if we can't recognise sex? Julie, mm. let me ask you, is your primary concern about the changes that uh, the gen this gender legislation bill would bring in? about the loosening um, of the rules and restrictions around getting a gender recognition certificate, or is it the gender recognition certificate altogether? Uh, by that I mean, are, are you particularly concerned about the changes which would see somebody essentially able to get one of these certificates quite easily now, whereas before you had to go through a long process with uh, medical supervision? Or is it the concept of the certificate altogether that really worries you? It's the concept of the certificate altogether, but I think that this has made it far worse to suggest that children um, can, in fact, just decide that they are the opposite sex and wish to live as the opposite sex. And everything that comes with that, which is the peddling of puberty blockers and then cross-sex hormones, which, of course, are irreversible. But I'll tell you what, what I do think in terms of, of trans rights. Well, first of all, so-called trans women, in other words, biological men, do have rights. They have men's rights. And, of course, trans people who live as the opposite sex, and I do know some and count some as my friends, do need to be able to live dignified lives, by which I mean if they're passing through uh, an airport with a male passport but presenting as female, I do not wish those people to be discriminated against or treated um, without dignity. So we do need some provision to protect those people living as the opposite sex because that is how they are living and that is a reality. But I think the idea that you can change your legal sex and then all of a sudden become recognised as women to all intents and purposes is a danger to women. This isn't about keeping trans women out of women's prisons, hospital wards or refuges. It's about keeping men out. Mm. 
And one of the legal problems, as I understand it, is that there has always been ambiguity around these certificates. Uh, so you're not just operating um, from a place where perhaps what Scotland is trying to pass is in conflict with the equalities legislation as Westminster understands it, but that there's confusion in general about the legal status of these certificates, which adds an additional layer of difficulty when trying to sort out this issue. Yeah, I mean, there is a conflict <clears throat> between the 2004 <clears throat> Gender Recognition Act, <clears throat> under which people are allowed to change their legal sex, change their birth certificate, get gender recognition certificates, and the 2010 Equality Act. And this has never really been addressed, never really been resolved. What takes precedence? Is it biological sex or is it gender identity? Um, now, what's happened in Scotland um, as a byproduct of this uh, introduction of self-ID is not only that it's accelerated rap massively the speed with which people can change their legal sex, it's also redefined legal sex as, 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 as taking precedence over biological sex, that it is for all purposes. You are a woman now in Scotland. So if a woman wants to have a a, a, a woman to be dealt with by a woman doctor, she risks um, a prosecution for discrimination if she uh, rejects a, a, a male bodied trans woman who has a gender recognition certificate because they are women in Scotland. Now, um, as I said, this is not the interpretation uh, in the UK. As Sue Ella Brahman, the Home Secretary, has made it very clear that she regards uh, biological sex as taking precedence over. Uh, gender identity. And the reason she says that is because there is this provision in the 2010 Equality Act which says that trans women can be excluded from all women groups like, you know, rape support groups. They can be excluded where there is a, is it, when it's a proportionate means to achieve a legitimate aim, whatever that means. In other words, written into the 2010 Act, there is this primacy of biological sex because how can you, how can you exclude a trans woman from a single sex group without reference to their birth sex, okay? I mean, there's all sorts of problems with that because of course it's also a criminal offense to expose somebody's birth sex if they're a trans person with a gender recognition certificate. None of these issues have really been addressed. This has exploded, what, what the, the Scottish government's move here has exploded this whole issue, it has to be resolved. I think it's a very good thing actually that it will go to judicial review and ultimately to the Supreme Court because somebody has to reconcile these contradictions. But in the, in the short term, I mean, it's, you know, this is overlaid, remember, by the constitutional issue. And one of the reasons the SNP has promoted this is because, well, it's a kind of provocation is to show that the UK Tory government are nasty, bigoted Tories and transphobic, where Scotland's really nice and progressive and, you know, all, all the rest of it. Also that the Tories are overriding the Scottish Parliament, running rushed, a full frontal assault on Scottish democracy is how Nicola Sturgeon has described this. It's not. Section 35 is part of the Scotland Act. It's part and parcel of devolution. It was supported, voted for by the SNP in 1998. And it's precisely there to address this kind of, to reconcile these contradictions across the border. And the fact that what's happening is that the Scottish law is running coach and horses to uh, e, uh, UK equalities legislation. And it's trying to introduce self-ID in England by the back door. Because the presumption of the, of uh, the LBGT groups, the Trent Stonewall in particular, who've been promoting this over the last decade, is that if they get it established in Scotland, you know, the rest of the UK will go along with it because it's too difficult otherwise. You can't have people changing sex at the border, so they'll have to just accept GRCs south of the border, and that will, will move us very far down this road. Truly, do you think that the Equalities Act, as it exists now, is broadly right? Or do you see the side of the SNP and their argument that the process could be made slightly easier, slightly more relaxing, just slightly more inclusive for somebody who's trying to transition? I don't want it to be easy at all in any way or possible for a man to say that he is a woman and to have that legal recognition and legal right. No, I believe people should be allowed to live as they wish, to express their gender if they think that that's what they have innately, as they wish. I do not want them to take our rights. There is a huge clash between the rights of men who identify as women and actual women. I think that Nicola Sturgeon is a disgrace to women. She is about as feminist um, as David Cameron. She is an absolute disgrace 
as a politician. And I just wish that she would stop her posturing and get off her perch and recognise that what she's done is harmful to women and that her legacy will be that she put vulnerable women in more danger than they are already in. Mm. Nicola Sturgeon insists, Julie, that uh, she's protecting women and protecting uh, the trans community. Do you think that ultimately this argument comes down to questions about gender, though, or questions about independence? And how do you feel about these questions about gender and sex getting wrapped up in questions about whether Westminster or Holyrood gets to make these decisions? I agree with what Ian says. She's she's ridden the coach and horses through legislation, through the Equality Act, and she clearly either does not know or does not care that what she has done with pushing this legislation through and ignoring those women's groups that work with abused women is that she has given rights to men over women and that she has given rights to rapists and to sexual offenders. And this is not to say trans people are sexual offenders because they're trans. It's to recognise that they are natal males and that they sexually offend at the same rate as do other men. Ian, where does it go from here? It was just mere days ago that Rishi Sunak was up in Scotland talking about cooperation and, and, and trying to work together. Uh, and now he has a real fight on his hands. You say it's going to the courts, but how does the politics play out as well? Well, there's been a there's been a lag, a huge lag here because uh, I mean it's only really now that it's become people in Scotland are becoming engaged with this issue. I mean, up until now, everyone broadly assumed, you know, that it's it's always about transgender rights. It's just about you know, prevent, protecting my minorities from discrimination. But it's not. It's about very much more than that. I mean, they are already protected. Trans people already have protection from discrimination. This is not about trans rights. In fact, it's really about women's rights. Uh, as Julie has, uh, has, has, has said. And it's only very recently. I mean, there have been people who have been arguing about this for a long time, like J.K. Rowling, for example, who has been you know, absolutely demonized and had, uh, has been treated appallingly by, not just by um, uh, trans activists, you know, but by liberals in general in Scotland who have really, you know, they've, they've uh, regarded her, they've accused her basically of being transphobic. Um, and that's because I think because people didn't didn't weren't really grasping what this issue was about. Now it's only now that this has been uh, had, there's been this explosive debate in Parliament, and people realise what self ID means. They realise that actually Police Scotland has for a long time now been recording uh, offenders, even sex offenders, under their assumed their gender identity, not their biological sex. So you do actually now have women rapists in Scottish jails, um, and you have offenders can change their sex now. Um, after they're prosecuted, so they can be moved into um, into women's, you know, a male, natal male sex offender can be moved into women's jail just by announcing that they're female. And and actually, and we've also discovered that some of them are changing back to their original uh, uh, gender or sex when they leave that prison. I mean, it, it's it is it creates all sorts of problems. And as I as I think I explained, the you know it's it's undermined, it's created huge anomalies in the UK in the introduction, the application of equalities legislation, because in Scotland now, it's absolutely clear, um, gender identity takes precedence over biology, biology sex, biological sex doesn't really have any legal status, it's only your legal sex that matters, if you have a gender recognition certificate, you are a woman, trans women are women now in Scotland, just as Stonewall has been uh, campaigning for, for, for many years. South of the border, that is not the case. And the interpretation, as I say, is very, very different. And women do appear to have protections which allow them to exclude people who are biologically male from certain groups. Um, and I think you know, what's happened in a way is that this, this the politics of this has you know, raised this, this fundamental issue, but it's also created a very interesting unionist coalition of, of very articulate women north and south of the border who are, are just not prepared to go along with, with all this. And I think the most significant move there has been the way that uh, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, UK Labour leader, suddenly made a U-turn this week before um, uh, the, this uh, law was vetoed and said, well, he's, no, he's concerned about it too. That has posed real problems in the Labour Party because, of course, the Scottish Labour leader, Anna Sarwar, whipped Labour MSPs, didn't allow our conscience vote on this, whipped Labour MPs into voting for this SNP legislation. So, you know, real political uh, divisions on both sides. It split the Scottish National Party very fundamentally. I mean, this is not 
by no means are uh, are most SNP members on side with what's going on. They're bewildered by it because you know what really does this have to do with independence? But if you look at it from the from um, you know uh, kind of the strategic point, political point, it creates a new a new border division, which the SNP can say, well, you know, here's here's England riding roughshod over the interests of the Scottish, the democratic will of the Scottish Parliament, all this kind of stuff. Well, no doubt this is a very delicate topic, and the contradictions that we've discussed here will be coming to the forefront, and we'll be discussing them in the weeks to come. And stay tuned for that. In the meantime, Anne and Julie, thanks for joining me. The government has allocated more of its £2.1 billion fund for levelling up, but not everyone is pleased about where that money is going. And with Sir Kiastama at the World Economic Forum's conference in Davos, Switzerland this week, is the Labour leader managing to convince business leaders that he is a Prime Minister in waiting? To talk about this week in politics, I'm joined now by our political editor, Katie Bowles. Katie, there's lots going on in Westminster this week, not just the showdown between Rishi Sunak and Nicola Sturgeon over the gender recognition bill, uh, but also over leveling up. And there's a lot of frustration, even in the Tory party, over where this new allocation of funding from the £2 billion pot for leveling up money is gone. Tell, talk us through it. Yeah, so this is the second of three allocations of the leveling up pot. And lots of bids went in. I think over 500 bids wow. and just over 100 have received. So uh, I think it's fair to say there are more unhappy MPs than <laughs> happy MPs. <laughs> you look at that, uh, those figures. Um, and this was, you know, not just for Tory MPs, it's for Labour MPs too. Um, but I think uh, there are lots of MPs complaining that they, you know, feel they led off a garden path. I don't think it's helped that we've had, you know, we're onto the third prime minister. So some of the conversations perhaps they've had with one prime minister where they felt like as though that, you know, their area or their bid was particularly heard hasn't necessarily right. carried over. Um, and then there's also a question about where the funds are going. So um, if you crunch the data, I mean, there's a few different readings of it, but it's certainly in the case that, um, you know, some constituents in the South have got quite a lot of funding and therefore Red Wall MPs are saying, well, wait, I thought levelling up as pitch in 2019 was all about uh, you know helping the Midlands and the North. Now there are clearly deprived areas and areas that need help across the country but I think uh, given the current polling and also the fact that lots of these Red Wall MPs think that Rishi Sunak has less appeal in the area than Boris Johnson did, I think it's just adding to this anxiety from those who've missed out that um, you know the words of one to me you know, they're being left you know to hang out to dry here um, and so therefore Interestingly, since Rishi Sunak has gone in, so much effort has gone to keeping MPs together on side, but this feels like a point where um, it, it is not uh, working the way number 10 would have hoped. Katie, is it fair to make assumptions um, about how the Tories might be thinking about the next election from these funding allocations? For example, would it be fair to say perhaps Rishi Sunak isn't as focused on those votes in the red wall and perhaps more focused on those seats where you could see more competition between, say, the Tories and the Lib Dems? So I think it's probably too early to say that in the sense that I think it's definitely the case that if you speak to senior figures in government, they think some of those Lib Dem Tory seats are, you know, ones that are actually quite competitive, uh, where, they, where they stand a chance, um, and you can link that up. There are so many things that go into consideration then when you're appointing these, you know, pots of money that I don't think it is just, and also the fact that Labour get, you know, I don't think it, as much as, uh, you know, we might think it's just someone looking at the electoral map and thinking this works, this doesn't. And I, I think it's uh, actually a process of looking at the areas that need it. The problem is it feeds into the anxiety of MPs who are already worried about their seats, who do have the perception that, um, you know, some MPs are saying in some of these, like, you know, red wall marginal seats, a lot of them have not got it. And I think they were really banking on it um, as, you know, uh, what was going to help them keep their seat given, uh, you know, Brexit, Boris Johnson, Jeremy Corbyn, the three factors that helped the Tories in 2019 are no longer in play. Um, right. Um, and there's one more round of funding to go, though, to be allocated. Do you think it's likely, perhaps, that uh, those seats will get a bit more attention in that final round, especially as we get closer to an election, which, again, big question mark over that date, but it will be closer than we are now? Certainly the message Downing Street are trying to send today, um, <laughs> to effectively saying, you know, don't, just wait. Give up all hope and right. uh, effectively, I think, saying don't throw your toys out the pram. There is another round to go. Um, but there is, I think there is a gripe you're hearing. And again, 
this is more complicated than just, you know, thinking, oh, there's a rich constituency, there's a poor constituency. But I think the fact that Rishi Sunak's seat has got funding, Geoffrey Cox's seat has mm-hmm. got funding, um, lots of people have pointed to the fact that uh, Alicia Kern's seat has got funding. Um, I wrote them Melton and saying, is, is that really where it should go? And of course, if you look at the projects, I think there's an argument in all these cases, but it is just, um, I think, adding to the sense of what is levelling up meant to be doing. And it's a problem the Tories have had ever since levelling up really was a slogan, which is, it's hard to define, it actually divides the party. And right now, lots of um, MPs who thought it would help them in the next election are worrying that it is going to fail to live up to that. Well, indeed, it's very hard to make good on a promise when your MPs all define it in a different way, and that's never really been established. Um, on to a, a different topic, Katie, and on to your uh, politics column this week. Uh, you write about how Rishi Sunak and Kiyostama are each trying to tell a different story about themselves um, in the context of the Stavos conference. Talk us through it. Yeah, so I think in recent years, Davos, I think it's safe to say, has gone out of fashion in terms of a place that you would want to be seen at, at least as a conservative politician. Um, So Theresa May, of course, went... uh, David Cameron, George Osborne, Boris Johnson did not go and actually banned all his ministers. And Rishi Sunak is following that tradition. He is allowing a representation in the form of Kemi Badenoch. I think it's fair to say that um, the International Trade Secretary is not particularly enthusiastic about the summit right. either. <laughs> quite keen to stress that she is not appearing on any panels. Right. Meanwhile, on the other side, uh, Labour, Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves are attending. They are sitting on panels and different discussions. And I think they want to have this moment to show, you know, we're on the world stage. I think... It works for both sides in the sense that I think the two, the two perceived weaknesses, so for Starmer, it's that Labour is anti-business um, and the two areas where Rishi Sunak leads over Starmer is on the economy and also on you know working with foreign leaders. Now, obviously, going to Davos should help him with both of those measures. Um, and then for Rishi Sunak, I think one of his big weaknesses is he's just perceived as being out of touch. Mm-hmm. The fact that he is viewed by many, even in his own party, as a member of the global elite due to his personal wealth, his wife's wealth, uh, the fact he had possessed of a green card um, when that came out lots of Tory MPs said you know it suggests he was a citizen of nowhere so I think the last place Rishi Sunak wants to be seen right now is Davos in the Alps um, and instead wants to show he's focusing on priorities here. And as you say, Kiyosama is trying to look prime ministerial. He's trying to suggest to the world that uh, Labour is going to be on the side of business. Do you think he's convincing people? I think Rachel Reeves um, is getting lots of good feedback. Uh, you know, I quote a Tory peer in the piece who went to a breakfast where she was speaking, um, the Shadow Chancellor, and saying, you know, he really wanted to dislike her, but actually found her uh, annoyingly convincing or reassuring. Not reassuring is probably a word too far, mm-hmm. um, and and that was worrying them. Um, I think there's an interesting question though in terms of at the moment Labour are doing almost a Blair playbook and they're trying to uh, mimic the Tories on various issues so um, NHS reform they're talking about they're talking quite tough on immigration they've gone to Davos these are all things parts of the left of the party will hate yes John McDonnell went to Davos but when he went to Davos he had quite a specific message right <laughs> <laughs> which is almost your time is times are changing you know you ought to change which is not the message of Keir Starmer and Rachel yeah. Reeves they are saying if Labour gets in Britain is open for business etc um, and I I think this far away from an election, if we work on the idea it's probably 18 months away, um, the positions Labour are taking are ones that are not popular with the left of the party. The fact that I think Labour look like they are heading to a big majority means they're staying on side, but it's quite a long time to keep up, you know, taking these positions, which ultimately are unpopular with some of your MPs. And I think there's a question of if the polls were to slide at all. And I mean, at this point, you can just imagine that Labour MPs could despite the fact this would still suggest a large majority, if the Labour leads somehow the next year went from 20 points to 12 points, right. I think lots of Labour MPs would suddenly start to question some of the direction of the, of, of the leadership in terms of taking these positions. So I think that's probably um, one to watch. Mm. Katie, thanks for joining me. Speaking of Davos, is anything really achieved there? The Spectator's business editor, Martin Van Der Weer, writes in this week's column that he's pretty cynical about the conference. I'm joined by Martin now. Martin, thanks for joining me on Spectator TV. So you're not joining from Switzerland, nor am I. As you write in your column this week, our invitations got lost in the mail. I know, it's funny that it happens every year. Yeah, after Shocking. Year. And you write to them, you update your address, and you're still not in Davos. Yeah, I'm kind of waving at them saying, hi, remember me. But no, no, no. The, the, the great stiff card with the freebie invitation to the, the Alps just, just never arrives. And then, 
you know, I've been waiting, waiting, waiting. And then, then I get these, you know, other commitments get into my diary. So, so this year I didn't make it up in the column. I really am tomorrow going to Driffield in East Yorkshire to you talk to the anyway. ladies luncheon club who will talk much more sense than most of the people. Well, I think that's Dallas. a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for our watchers at home who aren't as familiar with the World Economic Forum's annual mm. conference, can you just tell us a little bit about what Davos is and what we're making fun of? <laughs> yes, so Davos is shorthand for this uh, normally annual conference in the ski resort, lu luxury ski resort of Davos. It was started, I think, in the early 70s by a German economist called Klaus Schwab, who was a professor at Geneva University. It evolved in the 80s into something with the grand title of World Economic Forum. And through very clever marketing, and I must say, hats off to Mr. Schwab, who's still running this thing. Um, he managed to attract uh, a combination of world leaders, heads of pretty big businesses from around the world, limelight seekers, virtue signalers of all kinds, who are attaching themselves to it. So it's become a jamboree of, I think maybe uh, there's around 700 people this year. Um, and its agenda and its content get some coverage in the world media. So people kind of think this must be important, but actually it's a, it's a huge talking shop. It, there's something a bit vulgar. I don't know what you think. I think there's something a bit vulgar about all these mostly immensely rich people and self-important or actually important, but certainly rich, privileged, living in their silos of talking to other rich, privileged, important people flying in in private jets, discussing the problems of the world, including the problems of poverty and inequality from a position of extreme elitism. So, so in that sense, I am rather glad I've never actually had, had the invitation. Well, I think the conference has become known as, as this meeting point for the world's elite, whether they be the political elite, the financial elite, even the media elite to some extent. Um, and the public over the past few years have increasingly seen through this, I think. There have been a lot of uh, accusations of hypocrisy because certainly pre-COVID, the main talking point at Davos became climate change, and yet everybody was flying in on their private jets. Yeah. And they still are. I mean, that, that kind of behavior hasn't changed. But um, this year, the narrative around the conference almost seemed crafted before it started, which was with the cost of living crunch happening worldwide, how are you going to justify this extremely lavish conference where you know champagne is simply on tap uh, and you can tell there's been a bit of a PR spin reportedly a lot of the big parties have been scaled back um, but I mean what's odd to me is is people are saying you know you're gonna have to abandon your free market capitalism and your push for globalization at this conference and, and really focus on inequality as if Davos has ever really been about free market capitalism or, or globalization in the truest sense. I mean, you have the, the richest people in the world, as you say, Martin, the politicians and the businesses coming together to put together crony capitalism, not free yeah, market exactly. capitalism. And there was uh, quite an amusing uh, blog yesterday. Somebody who's there puts together comments and quotes from people who are there saying, if you really want to understand it, it's it's like a golf tournament where you have kind of photocopier vendors and you have businesses and the, the, the salesmen are trying to sell the photocopiers and that's basically <laughs> what it is. The, 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 the and there's no potential. competition. No one else gets to sell the photocopier, to be very clear. <laughs> the potential customers are very often governments, I'm right. told. Uh, my, my mole out there tells me the Indian government and Indian state governments are hugely sort of overrepresented there and there are plenty of, you know, Western businesses trying to sell them stuff. Siemens, the German company I saw had signed a deal selling a thousand trains to India, that kind of thing. So it's really a sort of sales conference disguised as a very high level talking Well, you shop. have to pay a lot of money to get into yeah, that sales yeah, conference, which is the key yeah. point. So what's on the agenda this year? Um, the, I believe that the, the f formal theme is cooperation in a fragmented world. What do we take away from that? Well, they, first of all, I think they had they started with a sort of economic report where uh, a large number of economists said we're heading into a recession. Wow, that's a, that's a real revelation, right? <laughs> we didn't know that. Um, and then I think what it is, it's about how do you steer your, 
your nation or your giant corporation through the combination of inflation, recession, the Ukraine conflict, populist unrest in unexpected places around the world, weather events, all this stuff, a, a concatenation of adverse factors. Um, my source says it, it, so far it's all doom and, and gloom. I don't know whether it's going to light up. Uh, they've got some celebrities there. Idris Elba was lecturing them about something. The rapper Will I Am. I'm not familiar with his work, but I he's understand. there. He's there. He's yeah. there. Tony Blair's there. Apparently, the funniest guy on. So a lot of celebrities. Basically. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of crypto um, players there. Crypto is rather out of fashion everywhere else, but a whole lot of them have gone to. Davos to uh, sell whatever Speaking they're selling. Of being out of fashion, I guess. I guess my last question to you, Martin, is: To what extent is a, a, an event like Davos still relevant post COVID? I mean, um, obviously, Russia is is a big topic of discussion there, and 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 Russia is not welcome at Davos this year, as I understand it. Um, but you know, thinking about the relationship to China, with China to Europe and the U.S. in particular, and those trade wars that are starting up again. You know, if the theme was cooperation, there isn't a lot of appetite for cooperation at the moment. In fact, a lot of these geopolitical dividing lines are being drawn as we speak. Um, does that make a conference like Davos even more difficult really to sell, especially to the people who need to spend a lot of money to get there? Well, let's try and take the most positive view sure. we can, which is to say, of course, it's good that top people, powerful people talk to each other. And it's good that they can meet in circumstances where sort of some barriers are removed. So probably the conversations in the in their very, very expensive champagne bars and so on are more valuable than the, frankly, if you look at it online, slightly vacuous panel discussions about, you know, what's going on in the world economy, which it seemed to me to be um, revealing nothing new at all. But it is useful that 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 people who run giant corporations do meet people who run uh, governments and so on and have some meeting in mind. So let's not dismiss it altogether. What's irrelevant about Davos is the sense that Davos man, the archetype, the, the guy in the private jet who thinks his own opinion is tremendously important and the world should listen to it and so on, he's really out of fashion. Mm -hmm. Now, I think perhaps Tony Blair is archetypal Davos man. And you know, the world doesn't particularly want to hear from him anymore. So I think good thing that there are a lot of conversations in the sidelines and probably some friendships being made, some useful contacts if contracts and deals are being done. And that's ultimately good for the citizens of the, the you know, buying country, as it were. Fine. Good luck to them. But don't don't um, don't tell us that we have to listen to you because you're wiser than the rest of the world because you are on the Davos invitation list. That's my <laughs> general view. Martin, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Goldman Sachs recently fired more than 3,000 employees but saw its stock rise by billions. The Spectator's literary editor Sam Leith writes this week that he finds the whole story quite pleasing. But is this really good news? Sam joins me now. Sam, great to see you on Spectator TV. So you wrote for Coffee House this week about Goldman Sachs' decision to fire roughly 3,000 employees and how this is expected to have increased the company's value by several billion pounds. And you found the whole thing quite amusing. Yeah, I mean, I'm afraid my reaction to this was not that of a kind of deeply informed macroeconomist. Um, but somebody th simply found it very funny that the figure which the bottom line, the market cap of Goldman Sachs went up 3.3 billion was almost exactly a multiple of the 3,200 people they laid off, which say that each employee, um, by not being there, made the company worth more than a million dollars more. Um, and this strap is very funny on the grounds that generally, you know, we would assume that an employee is there because they're held to add some value to the company rather than subtracting it. Well, you write about how this is a wider trend of big companies at the moment. Facebook laid off 11,000 workers and saw its stock price jump. Uh, Elon Musk got rid of roughly 75% of Twitter's workforce without it making much difference uh, to how the website runs. What do you think this says about how these businesses were operating before these firings? Well, there's this, this um, 
kind of phrase which I, I borrowed from the report I read of surplus elites. I mean, I've never been sure about elite um, as, a, as a noun for a single person, but that seems to be the way people are, are using it now. Um, but I think it kind of implies or hints that, you know, the sector of the, the workforce that we tend to think of as a kind of precariat, the people whose jobs are at risk from industrialization and mechanization has tended to be kind of manual labor, you know, the things that can very obviously and easily be done by robots. And this seems to me to herald a sort of shift um, into position where management itself is something that can be done with fewer people, can be automated more, and that suddenly the precariat are exactly those people who used to be doling out the P45s to their um, manual labouring colleagues. Um, I mean, it, it, the problem, of course, is as well, is that you management and all those sorts of white-collar jobs are much harder to quantify. You know, if you're punching rivets or assembling things, you know, you can do a sort of tailorization assessment of how how much work you're doing per hour, how much work the machine does. Whereas, as we all know, people in, you know, well-heeled management jobs seem to spend an awful lot of time kind of drinking coffee and holding meetings in which nothing is really discussed. So, you know, one thinks, where, where's it all going to end? I read today um, that Microsoft, um, I, I, I wouldn't claim to know for sure that they're influenced by reading my Coffeehouse blog, um, but are laying off 10,000 workers worldwide. So it, it's certainly a trend. And I think people are discovering, you know, if you lay off 10,000 people, maybe the bottom line goes up by however many billion. Um, and we, we might see a bumpy ride as they start to experiment with how far that can be taken. I'm speculating here, Sam, but I do have to wonder if all of these redundancies would have happened pre-COVID. Um, and I'm just thinking about that mass exodus from the office and people moving to working from home. And, you know, there was a lot of discussion at the time about how um, for a lot of people that was easier and they probably would have been in a lot of these jobs. People who say already own their property, who own a, a large piece of property, uh, who have that extra bedroom that they can work out of. Um, and we were talking about all the benefits that came from having a desk job, uh, certainly a high income desk job that can now be done from home. But, you know, a big question mark was always going to be what businesses discovered during this time. Um, and when, you know, going for that coffee break and exchanging pleasantries in the hall and that kind of day-to-day -day interaction was no longer accounted for in the job, what were they going to discover when they were just looking at the hard numbers about what you were producing? And some people thought that was going to lead to some redundancies as companies realized they could make efficiency gains and they didn't actually need as many workers as they had hired. Well, maybe. I mean, you'd think that they make certain efficiency savings even without cutting staff by simply not having to rent all that very expensive office space. And I think we've seen an awful lot of that in terms of the way big companies have rearranged. Um, and there are questions about how much you can tell whether people are on the skive. Um, I know there's been a lot of needle in a number of companies about the way in which you know uh, managers are using sort of tracking devices on your computer to check how often you're actually in front of your desk. It's a little big brother for me, but yes, apparently it is happening. But I think there's, you know, we're seeing a lot of that, a lot of that post-COVID stuff probably shaking out. But in general, it's maybe it's just a wider thing about the fact that a lot of people in management don't do all that much day-to-day -day and can be, can, can be replaced with more people. I mean, the problem, the, the sort of wider problem, and here's where you... Kate, I think we'll have much more sensible things to say about it than me, is that obviously the economy um, to work doesn't just need people producing, it needs people consuming. And robots and machines and chat GBT are very, very good at the first, first half of that, but they're not so good at the second. Um, I mean, I think somebody, I think it was one of the comments on my piece, said that Henry Ford had boasted that he could soon make 80% of the workforce redundant. And he said, yes, but who's then going to buy your automobiles? Um, I mean, you may have an answer to this, but but what is what is the solution once, once the producing is all done by a very small number of modestly paid people? Who's going to buy the things that are consumed? Well, this has been a concern for, I mean, 
throughout many generations. You know, what are today's technological advancements going to do to the workforce? Are they going to destroy the supply and demand economy and all the rest of it? And the truth is that those threats just have not come to fruition yet. Um, you know, people have been made redundant by automation, but they tend to find new work. And as automation comes in, it actually often creates new kinds of jobs for the people that are affected by it. So we haven't really lived through it. You know, there's always temporary displacement, and that is a concern. It's not to be overlooked, but we haven't really lived through a time yet where this has fundamentally transferred sort of the role of the person to the role of machines. It's just transferred what they actually do. Uh, and you used a phrase before about the, the surplus elite. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting to think about those people who are being made redundant now. No doubt their skill set is going to allow them to find new jobs. I mean, these are probably not people who are going to be out of work for the rest of your lives. But, you know, you're right to ask questions about what happens when well-qualified people don't find themselves in the workforce. Um, but you could also, you know, quite simply say, this is simply the effects of the looming recession, the global recession that, you know, most people think is coming. I know we've had some good economic data in the UK. Maybe if we're very, very lucky, we'll, we'll miss the technical definition of recession by a percentage point. But um, it, it seems, you know, that we are entering into more difficult economic times. And it's a reminder that everyone is affected by that. Of course, if you're on the lower end of the income scale, you're going to be disproportionately affected by that. But the uh, surplus elites are as well. Tough luck on them. <laughs> um, Sam, I guess my last question to you is, what do you think this is going to do uh, from a political perspective? Uh, now that the high income earners are experiencing these layoffs um, that are associated increasingly with automation, are we going to see more of a backlash? Might we get some bankers unions? I don't know. It's a, it's a nice sort of ticklish idea. Um, I mean, I suppose that it's, you know, as a rule, if you're on the, you know, more affluent end of the scale you know the, the, the politics that represent you you know you're probably not really going to i mean i i suppose theoretically there'll be you know goldman sachs former goldman sachs employees suddenly joining the corbynite wing of the labor party but i I can't see that happening in droves. I think they're pretty much stuck with the Tories. <laughs> uh, and let's not forget that they probably have uh, pretty nice uh, payment packages going out the door. And nest eggs and property. So, yeah, they've got nowhere else to go, I think. <laughs> Sam, thanks for joining me. And finally, Noma, often referred to as the world's best restaurant, will be closing its doors. What does this mean for fine dining? To discuss, I'm joined by Olivia Potts, who writes the Spectator's Vintage Chef column, and Rory Sutherland, who writes our Wikiman column. Rory and Liv, thanks for joining Spectator TV. Liv, it's been announced that Noma, often called the world's best restaurant, is closing. What do you make of this? So Noma is known for its experimental cooking, but also its very intensive cooking. So it serves long tasting menus uh, where you don't swap out dishes and you pay a substantial amount of money in advance before you turn up. Um, and it requires a huge brigade of chefs to create this meal for a limited number of dines. Um, and the reason that has really been given for Noma closing is that it, it basically doesn't work. It doesn't work as an economic model. I think they've also said that they, they don't feel that they can continue in good faith doing it in the way that they perhaps have in the past. Um, but basically, they can't make that kind of food for that quantity of people work financially. Um, and in the past, they have perhaps, <laughs> they've perhaps done a bit better by using huge amounts of unpaid labour in the form of stages, which is chefs' work experience or internships, or long-term paid interns. Um, and they stopped doing that in October. And suddenly, it's no longer financially viable. Rory, what do you make of all this? I mean, it all depends how you define the world's best restaurant, of course, because the world's best restaurant, and before it, of course, we had El Bully, which also closed down, I suppose. Um, the world's best restaurant will always be, almost by definition, slightly weird. And is the best restaurant where you go once to have the best meal of your life, or what you post-rationalize as the best meal of your life, partly because it's the most expensive meal of your life, <laughs> um, or is the best restaurant one you'd like to go back to fairly frequently? And there is a trade-off here between what you might call singularity and repeat business. And one thing about fine dining in general is that most people don't like it all the time or very frequently. 
In fact, if you have fine dining meals three nights in a row or three times in a week, you'll start craving beans on toast. Liv, the founder of Noma has suggested that the model of fine dining is just no longer sustainable. Also talking about the financial and emotional toll that it takes on a human being, quote, it just doesn't work. Um, it sounds like the economic model was questionable for Noma and I'm sure um, coming under more and more scrutiny. Can you tell us a bit more about the culture of kitchens as well, though, because that seems to be a factor here. Yeah, I think the kitchen culture is something that has quite rightly come under increased scrutiny um, over the last few years. Um, traditionally, kitchens since the French Revolution have been organised in brigades. Um, and there is a lot of sense in that, in the, in the way that sort of individuals are, are responsible for their sort of set areas and then come together as a team to create a meal. But what has gone along with the, the brigade model is is a an army atmosphere a sort of you know you go into a kitchen as a as a junior chef and you are broken down to be built back up you have to be able to take shouting you have to be able to take huge criticism you have to be able to take often in kitchens violence and for a long time there was a real received belief received wisdom that you know, if you couldn't stand that heat, you should get out of the kitchen, that that was the right way for it to be done. And that um, you just really had to toughen up if you wanted a career in professional kitchens. That has <laughs> quite rightly been hugely criticised in, in the past few years. Um, I think uh, Red Zeppi, the, the owner of Noma, is one of the chefs who's come out to... Um, criticise his own previous behaviour and say, I didn't, I didn't treat my staff in the way that I should have done. Um, and, to, and, and, and there are other chefs who said, you know, I behaved in ways and ran my kitchen in ways that, that I don't feel good about now. So we are starting to see some kind of accountability. Um, but there is certainly a truth that in really high-end kitchens, not all of them by any stretch of the imagination, but, but a lot, um, there is a, a pretty unpleasant working culture that uh, fetishizes very long hours, physical pain, um, unpleasant attitudes between staff, and, and often in an attempt to kind of keep up with the pace of that really intense physical work, drug abuse and alcohol abuse. And I think that there's been a lot of time calling on that recently. And perhaps if we're looking at healthier working atmospheres, it, it does make those kitchens that are particularly intense in the food they're producing, the work they're doing, less sustainable. Rory, what do you make of this? Uh, you know, as a diner, I sort of look at the kitchen door and think whatever's happening behind it is mysterious and, and magical, and for a long time assume that, you know, scenes from films and television depicting the kitchen as this, you know, extremely aggressive place, as Liv just described, just, you know, that must be fiction, that must be television and fantasy. But um, it sounds like that w it has been reflecting what's actually been going on for staff behind those kitchen doors. Yes, it raises parallels with things like our electronic goods are quite often manufactured under conditions that we ourselves wouldn't tolerate. You know, uh, there are quite a lot of hearty meat eaters who would be sickened by a visit to an abattoir or a sausage factory. And what happens behind the kitchen door or indeed the hotel um, staff room door, perhaps, that might be even more extreme or the cruise ship um, at staff door. Um, what's actually going on there and the pay and conditions would be considered almost intolerable, but people seem to be willing to turn a blind eye so long as they're enjoying the consequences. But I think, I think you'll undoubtedly find that there is a backlash against this, and probably there may be a backlash against that structure as well. Is that fair? Uh, that the absolutely sort of militaristic structure of how kitchens are, 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 are run uh, might change. I've been quite intrigued, quite a good book, actually, very good book, uh, Unreasonable Hospitality by Will Gudara has just come out, and he was the chap who ran um, uh, 11, Madison, uh, 11 Madison Park in New York. And I think he's gone on now, fascinatingly, to run Shake Shack, and it's a very interesting book because it, it points out that their magic was actually in resolving an apparent contradiction between what you might call fine dining, which is a kind of perfectionism, 
and hospitality, which relies on human warmth. And, uh, you know, the one of them is absolutely rigorous and militaristic. And the other one, by definition, just re requires a much more empathetic approach. And um, he argues that their real success came when they stopped seeing those two things as opposites and realized you could resolve them. And part of that involved a different kitchen culture. You know, he, his chef, who was absolutely instrumental in his success, uh, was told after he'd thrown food in an employee's face for doing a bad job that um, effectively, if that ever happens again, it doesn't matter how eminent you are as a chef, you're out. Mm -hmm. Liv, do you think that this model then of restaurants trying to one-up each other always serving something larger, more extravagant, is coming to an end, especially as customers discover what's been happening behind these closed doors. Presumably more and more of them are not going to want to support um, that kind of regimen that you and Rory have been describing. I mean, I really hope that we will see diners making informed decisions not to eat at establishments that, that we know um, treat their staff poorly, whether that's front of house or back of house or both, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, I don't think it's, I think, I mean, I would love it to be the death of one-upmanship because I, I, I don't think that's a fun place for restaurants to be. And at the end of the day, eating out is like, it's entertainment, isn't it? You go to a restaurant, not for its nutritional value, but to, to be entertained and to, to spend a, a lunchtime or an evening there. Um, I don't believe it will be the end of interesting maybe weird cooking or even really high level cooking I hope we'll see it on a smaller scale um, with new chefs coming through who don't sort of have, have their hand on the the throat of the hospitality industry and that, that it will open up I mean I, I'm a little bit of an optimist I'm not I'm not sure how easy that is but what I am confident of is that there are there is real talent out there who continue to do new and exciting things with food and will continue to do that in a variety of different ways and different venues. And perhaps what we will see is that you, you won't have to have gone and done your Noma stage or in the old days an El Bully stage, which every chef ever had on their CV because they could say they've been there. We'll simply see people... Um, being able to kind of step out on their own a little bit more um, and make their mark without having to kind of jump jump through these fine dining hoops that previously existed. I think there'll always be those restaurants, which in the words of the Michelin Guide are vol le voyage. Um, partly it's bragging rights, partly that what we spend on a meal, rather like what we spend on wine, is not so much a kind of price value equation. We spend more to mark an occasion. And so there will always be, I think, a need for those hyper expensive places. But what you do see is one hyper competition in a very narrow space doesn't really lead to much improvement. Uh, it, it, it becomes a kind of a sense, a kind of, um, uh, you know, what, what's called a red ocean strategy. And you also notice phenomena like restaurants deliberately setting out not to receive Michelin stars because they argue that the cost of continuing to meet those criteria, both in terms of simple expenditure, but also perhaps in terms of lost custom. You know, they would rather run a place where people, you know, come back frequently and where, you know, uh, you have maybe, you know, three sittings at night and everything's quite a bit more casual. They'd simply rather run that kind of establishment for all kinds of other reasons. And therefore, the constraints of having a very tightly defined idea of what fine dining constitutes um, then becomes a creative obstacle, really. So, they're, they're, I mean, I think, I, think that, I think that kind of weird, very high-end restaurant, I think there's a need for it. Uh, fundamentally, uh, how profitable it is to actually do it is another question. You always have that slightly odd French thing where the French work almost more for stature than they do for money. It's not completely a capitalist country. And there are always a load of French people who would rather run a loss-making restaurant, which frequently has, you know, Christine Lagarde as one of the customers. They'd much rather do that than run a chain of 100 highly profitable burger joints. So, you know, there, there are always going to be these weird... Um, anomalies where people are doing this for you know status and stature reasons rather than for commercial reasons. 
Liv and Rory, thanks for joining me. That's it for this week. Once again, thanks to Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management for sponsoring the week in 60 minutes. Canaccord will provide you with the experience you need to help you build your wealth with confidence. Visit CanDoWealth.com for more information. Thanks again for watching and do join us again next week. Thank you.